So this is um, an introductory lecture to Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, I want to put the play itself into a historical context, Shakespeare's time, uh, give a brief outline of that, talk about the drama of the period, what it was like, and then um, an account an introductory account of Shakespeare's plays and Hamlet. Um, so we'll go from a global to a, a kind of local um, introduction. Uh, I think it'll be useful for understanding the play. Um, so the, the <clears throat> um, Shakespeare writes most of his plays uh, during the latter part of the reign of Queen Elizabeth. In England, the, the Elizabethan period, which runs from 1558 to 1603. So it ends while Shakespeare is still writing plays. Um, however, um, um, this this is it's, it's not much later than that. Most of his plays have, have, have been written at this point, I think. So um, this is the flowering of of the, the Renaissance period. Uh, this this late 16th early 17th century um, it in England is considered a, a, the golden age of literature both poetry and drama um, flourish at this time uh, Queen Elizabeth was a great patron of poetry and plays um, the period was politically stable um, because of her strong her strong rule um, and um, so given that that sort of political stability combined with um, combined with the real sense of the growing colonial power of England uh, you've got a period where the possibility of um, the possibility of stagecraft and and poetry in general um, is able to flourish. Uh, so while the period is politically stable, there is there is some internal um, internal unrest. Um, the period is fraught with religious tensions, religious dissent. Um, the period um, of uh, this period um, in which Elizabeth takes over um, is um, is um, is a period of religious turmoil um, and um, it this political stability is is gained at a price and that price is the violent suppression of religious dissent against the Church of England. Uh, this holds true for Protestant sects, um, especially the rise of Puritanism and as well uh, Catholicism. Uh, Catholicism was brutally suppressed. Uh, it was outlawed um, it was a requirement of of, um, of English citizenry, citizenry to participate in the Church of England, um, and um, the church, uh, the Catholic Church, was was outlawed. It actually was a, a criminal offense. Uh, the way this was implemented was that priests. Catholic priests were um, were brutally tortured and executed when they were found. Uh, they would be taken from from um, London and dragged on what were called hurdles. They would be a series of logs that were tied together and run on the ground, and the priests would be tied there and with their with their body, and they would bounce on these hurdles for about 20 miles, it would 
frequently break all their ribs. Uh, they would get to the end of this uh, and they would be um, hanged, uh, not hanged, executed, but hanged, pulled up and, and sort of hanged until they were almost dead and they would be brought down. And then usually their entrails would be ripped out and while they're still attached, then put in boiling hot oil. Um, and then they would be uh, drawn and quartered. They would be put, each of their limbs would be put uh, with four horses and um, they would rip the limbs off. The horses would go in all four directions and rip the limbs off. Sometimes the, the unfortunate person would still be alive at this point um, and would have his heart cut out. Uh, so, um, yeah, this was a, a brutal suppression of Catholicism. Uh, and, uh, and, and Puritans were also, also persecuted as well. So there was a, there was a period of political uh, unity, but, but religious tension. Some of these tensions are articulated um, in Shakespeare's plays. Uh, Hamlet does have um, does have some elements of religious tension in it. We'll take a look at that. Um, I'm, it's unclear how much it has to do with Hamlet's own mind, but um, and his own his own difficulties, but. Clearly, that's there. Um, so Elizabethan drama was influenced by medieval dramatic traditions, mystery and moral plays. Shakespeare frequently uses medieval settings for his plays. Hamlet is not one of these. It's not based upon a medieval uh, time period. Um, and one of the keys to recognizing this is the fact that Hamlet seems to have studied at a, uh, a Protestant, a Lutheran school where he's learned Protestant theology. Um, whether we can conclude that Hamlet himself what is a Protestant or not is, a, is another issue. There are other elements of this play that suggest a Catholic belief, and we'll talk about that. Um, so while... Medieval traditions were, were an influence on Elizabethan drama. It largely deals with human beings in the world, uh, with contemporary themes and questions raised and dramatized. In that sense, it's a secular world that's being dealt with. Not, not a religious, but a world of everyday men and women living their lives in ordinary situations. Um, it would not be as in medieval times, closely linked with priestly manners and, pre and, and sex, with, with clerical issues. Um, so uh, again, while there's religious elements to it, um, uh, th this is a largely modern, at least contemporary for Shakespeare, uh, set of themes. All levels of society would be represented. All forms of action, good and evil, Indifferent. Uh, Shakespeare's plays plumb the depths of human nature and explore human emotions, psychological states, social relationships, political relationships, um, moral issues, sometimes religious issues. Uh, that being said, the backdrop, and there are religious elements, is, is largely Christian. There's no doubt that Shakespeare is a Christian, writing for Christians. Um, the, the whatever whatever um, religious issues that that might have might have provoked Protestants or Church of England who are I guess Protestants Church of England um, um, defenders and those who 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 are part of the Church of England uh, they they seem to have been uh, put in a context where, where um, if they were raised, they wouldn't raise um, uh, objections. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a fraught issue. Um, 
Shakespeare, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Shakespeare was born on April 23rd, 1564, and died April 23rd, 1616. Very strange, interesting point. Um, not much is known about his life. Um, he was an actor, um, and he wrote plays in which he acted in. Um, although, although there are some, I don't think this is largely the, the center of Shakespeare studies, but there are some, some, uh, scholars of Shakespeare who argue that Shakespeare did not in fact write the plays. Uh, there are other candidates, um, but, um, the, the, the question of Shakespeare's authorship, authority, not only on the plays, but the sonnets as well. He wrote a cycle of sonnets, which are considered some of the greatest poems ever written. Um, there, there seems to be a question largely because, um, because Shakespeare's identity is unknown. It, that, that bothers people on um, they, they can't imagine how a, a fairly common person like Shakespeare could have been such a genius. Um, there are others, I'll talk about that in a minute, there are others who claim he is Catholic. Um, and um, there, this argument has been advanced by a number of scholars out there. Um, I will say this about about that issue um i think it's largely undecidable whether shakespeare was a catholic or not there is certain unusual aspects of his plays that do not fit in with a, a reforming attitude that is an attitude that would be that would be non-catholic Let's just make this point. Um, if you were not a Catholic, if you were Church of England or Protestant, you would be violently anti-Catholic. There, there doesn't seem to be anti-Catholic elements in his plays. Um, whenever, especially in plays like Romeo and Juliet um, and other, other plays where priests and nuns are represented, they are always presented positively. And this goes against the very stock literary representation of, of, um, of Catholic priests and nuns as, as hypocrites, as immoral, um, as iniquitous. So it goes against the stock representation of the Catholic religious. Uh, there are also images that and, and ideas that are Catholic that are presented um, and not for ridicule, which is an odd thing in Shakespeare. Again, I don't think it matters. Um, I'm, not, I'm not advocating Shakespeare as a Catholic, but we'll talk about some of the elements in Hamlet that are, that are Catholic. Um, I once had a conversation with the most well-known Shakespeare scholar alive today named Stephen Greenblatt. He teaches at Harvard. I, he was at a lecture when I was at Boston College many years ago, and I, I sort of buttonholed him after the, after the lecture and sort of worked him into a corner, but I wouldn't let him go and question him. And uh, The lecture was on his, what he sees as, as all these Catholic elements of, of, in Shakespeare's plays. He gave a kind of Freudian reading of it, which I didn't quite disagree agree with. But, but the fact that he's acknowledging these Catholic elements in the Shakespeare's plays is an interesting point, because he's Greenblatt is an atheist and has, has no interest in defending Catholicism at all. So, at any rate, um, it's an issue, um, but um, an issue I think that, uh, as you'll probably notice by now, I. I'm not big on, on trying to get into authors' minds. Uh, we have the text. We have the plays. That's all we have to go on. Sometimes biographical information is useful. 
but um, I always think we need to go back to the play or go back to the poem. And if we can't decipher it there, then I, I don't know how much help it is to go back to one's biography uh, to figure that out. So um, there's no doubt that Shakespeare was the greatest playwright of modern times. Uh, his poetry is also, you know, some of the greatest um, ever written, his sonnet sequence. Uh, people read them and, and comment on them and quote them. Um, the, the interesting aspect of, of the criticism of Shakespeare, of, of Shakespeare is the capaciousness of his mind, his, his ability to, to plumb human nature and to, um, to consider key aspects of human nature within the context of a drama. Uh, his his knowledge of history, his knowledge of of Italian um, of Italian customs, because a lot of his plays are set in, in Italy. Um, his knowledge of, of political issues, um, his seeming knowledge of of plays and poems and. and were and, and narratives that have been in prose that have been written. Hamlet is based upon a narrative, prose narrative. A, a story would have been known. It's what it's what Shakespeare does with this story that's so remarkable. Um. So the 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 the, the magnificence of the language. Um. The, 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 the plays themselves are great poetry. Um, some of the greatest poetic lines ever written, we find Juliet speaking in Romeo and Juliet. Um, so um, the, the, the language, the, 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 the wit, the humor, the seriousness, uh, the breadth, um, all confound people in regard to Shakespeare. And so the, the idea that this kind of bumpkin with very little seeming education could have written these plays confounds some people and they just have to search for other, other um, causes of this. Um, Coleridge has an interest, very interesting comment about the way Shakespeare is able to inhabit his characters and Shake Coleridge says that Shakespeare projects himself um, into every character that he creates and becomes them while maintaining from within the narrative structure itself a kind of unified vision of the world um, which is a very difficult thing to do, to project yourself and never lose sight of the center of the dramatic action, um, to become Ophelia, to become Gertrude, to become Claudius, to become Hamlet, and to speak in their voice and say their, the things that come out of their mind and their heart, right? And make them so convincing, make them alive just through the words. And actors have to inhabit these it's already there. The, it's the language, the, the 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 character is already there. It's the job of the actor to come and inhabit those things. This is the remarkable sort of um, of um, the remarkable sort of um, ability that Shakespeare has in his in his plays. So they would have been performed at the Globe Theatre on the Thames River in London. Um, if you go to London, you can still go see a play at the Globe Theatre. Uh, it's been, it's been um, recreated perfectly based upon many, many illustrations of pictures that we have of the thing um, in the exact spot that it's in on the Thames River. Um, it's on the other side of the, of the Thames from where most of the Important things that if you go to London, you go to see the Tower of London and Par House of Parliament and Big Ben, and, you know, at Westminster Abbey. Uh, it's on the other side. 
Um, but that side is interesting as well. I've gotten lost over on that side of the river. I've been to London many times. But um, So um, <clears throat> you can go still see a play. Um, it was popular entertainment. All levels of life came to see the plays um, from, from the highest in the court uh, to the lowest laborers and scoundrels um, and highwaymen you could, in, the, in, the, you know, in, the cult, in the in the society. Um, so it's, this is like watching television for us. Um, you know, it's, it's normal culture. Uh, Shakespeare's language is difficult for us, but would have been understood by the masses then quite easily. Um, if you have trouble with the, the words, the reason I've chosen the Arden Shakespeare, and this really, you really have to have this text. It's very important to have this text here. Um, and, and use the ISBN number because it's the it's the it's the second quarto published in 1604 1605 that we're using. Um, if you've got any other edition, uh, it's going to be different. It's going to have there's things that are left out um, of other editions. This is the longest version of Hamlet we have. Um, so um, make sure to have that. Uh, the the notes are extremely helpful, extremely useful. You'll find extremely useful notes in there to aid you in, in the meanings of words. Frequently, um, words um, that are that are that are used have double meanings. Uh, there's a number of sexual jokes that um, that Hamlet makes about Ophelia. In the scene with the play in the play, play within the play, where he's trying to catch the conscience of the king. Um, these can only be understood and have to be understood to know what know what Hamlet is doing to Ophelia. Um, they have to be understood in order to get um, the jokes there. So uh, you should take a look. If you you should take take a sometimes you've got sometimes you've got like the 147, it's two lines and there's more notes. Frequently, the notes take up half the page and they're useful and they don't, I think, distract from the drama, drama of, of following the play. So um, pay, pay attention to the notes. That's why I've used this edition. It's the Arden Shakespeare is the best for the notes. It's helpful. Um, so thousands and thousands of scholarly works have been written on Hamlet. Since 1990, four, over 400 a year, um, thousands of actors have played Hamlet on stage. John Gielgud, Laurence Olivier, John Neville, Mel Gibson, Simon Beale, um, Edwin Booth, uh, John Wilkes Booth's brother, Edmund Keane, David Garrick. Those are all early, early uh, performers of Hamlet. Um, so, um, we're using the, the second quarto that's published in 1604, 1605, because it derives from, it has its source in an authorial man, manuscript that we can attribute to Shakespeare's hand. Um, it, it was published in Shakespeare's life. It superseded the first quarto. Immediate and 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 it was it was after it was staged, um, so it suggests a kind of revision of a flawed edition, um, and so um, it seems to have a kind of close proximity to to the to the original, both from Shakespeare's hand and from its performance on stage, which was after all its intention, right. Um, it was intended to be performed. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So the Reg Folks, who um, who also was the editor, if you noticed, of Coleridge's Lectures in Literature, um, Reg Folks was a 
Coleridge scholar and a Shakespeare scholar, famous, famous scholar of both. I knew him. Um, he was a very old man when I met him, but a, one of the one of the more kindlier uh, scholars that I've ever met. Extremely kind and gracious, helpful. I was a very young. I was a graduate student when I first met him. He was very kind to me, and helpful to me. Um, but he is a great Coleridge scholar and a great Shakespeare scholar. He claimed that King Lear is the greatest play above Hamlet. But that's quite great praise because the claim is that Hamlet is, is greater. Um, and, you know, um, I, I don't know whether it's worth arguing about. Um, it, it, there, there, are some, there are some grounds for liking Hamlet. Um, for thinking Hamlet, uh, thinking King Lear is above Hamlet. Um, but um, there are certain things in Hamlet that we don't have in, in Lear. And one of them is the, is the soliloquies. There are solo soliloquies in Hamlet. These are moments on stage when one actor would recite long addresses that would be uttered to the audience. But they disclose the the thinking of the person. Um, the soliloquies which reveal Hamlet's consciousness and his thought patterns, his logic are extremely rich and evocative of key elements of human nature. Um, not only Hamlet's personality, but a kind of a kind of element in human nature um, which uh, is universal, and that is the the, the thing the, the reflection on the things we don't do, the things we regret not having done, uh, the actions we regret not having taken. Um, so um, that aspect of human nature, uh, which I think everybody can come to recognize, is dramatized in Hamlet. Um, we also have the language of the dialogues. And, and the soliloquies themselves with are tremendously high poetic, of tremendously high poetic value and merit. Uh, we read them for their poetry, not just their meaning. Their meaning, but also their poetic expression. Um, so um, there, is, there are links with, with Oedipus Tyrannus, and they come through... <laughs> Uh, interestingly enough, through our friend Sigmund Freud, who in the interpretation of dreams, where he established the Oedipal complex, he also, in, in, that, in those passages where he talks about the, Oedip the Oedipus complex, or the deep desire to, to kill daddy and marry mommy, and that has to be worked out in positive ways, psychically, for human beings to enter into mature uh, stages of psych psychic growth. Um, he argues that Hamlet suffers from the Oedipal complex, um, that that he's a representative of a kind of male madness that takes place when the Oedipal complex is not properly assimilated and overcome in 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 psychic development. Um, he he argues that that this uh, subconscious or unconscious desire to kill the father and marry the mother has actually been performed by his uncle um, Claudius, um, who has now supplanted the psychic space that Hamlet wants to inhabit. Right, so he has actually done in act. What, what Hamlet is desirous of doing but forbidden to do. And there's a lot of weird moments where, where there's, a, there's a, a mentions of incest and stuff like that uh, by Hamlet. His accusation, his, his, his suspicion of Claudius and his mother as well. There are elements in the play that suggest a kind of erotic relationship between Gertrude his mother and Hamlet. Um, the 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 movie by Mel Gibson, 
portrays this rather well. And um, I'll say it here. I've, I've decided. I think I've, I've pretty much decided that your paper on Shakespeare will be a, some sort of comparison of the film, the 1990 film with Mel Gibson playing Hamlet, uh, which is famous, a famous, famous version. Um, and and the, and the actual play that we, the text of the play that we. Have. So the Oedipal complex <laughs> comes into play here with tragic consequences. Um, Ophelia, who is Oedipus, oh Oedipus, who is Hamlet's love interest, <coughs> kills herself because of. Hamlet's ill treatment of her. She is played brilliantly by Helena Bonham Carter in this in this film, in which the in which the sexual elements are are brought out into public, uh, into on, on display, in a way that many many earlier versions of the play have not been able to do. Uh, you'll see you'll see the scenes at which this takes place. Helena Bonham Carter is a brilliant, crazy Ophelia. Ophelia goes mad and eventually kills herself. Uh, her her depiction of that madness is, is is I think unparalleled. Um, so um, she exhibits for many readers uh, the the female version. Of, of madness, the kind of bodily form of eroticism, which which gets played out in, in kind of infantile eroticism and, and winds up expressing itself ultimately in suicide. Um, so um, so again, Freud, Freud, and, and there's, there's links to our old friend Oedipus and and to Oedipus Tyrannus, um, and there's strangely enough, it links to uh, Beowulf. Um, the court here is Denmark, the, the scene of, of Beowulf. I'm not sure if Shakespeare had anything in mind there. It's not clear. Although, although it does continue an exploration of a kind of political drama that, of the court life. Uh, of course, this wouldn't be a medieval court. This would be um, a Christian court. But that idea of revenge... That idea of vengeance, which Christianity was able to stifle and perhaps uh, eradicate as an ideal, but never able to eradicate as an action and as an intention and as a desire of human nature, that comes into play, I think, and is articulated in a way that's quite brilliant. Um, so the play is classified as a tragedy, obviously. Um, the language you should pay attention to, the poetic language, um, the text as a as a as a literary product. Um, one of the more interesting aspects of Hamlet, which also I think raises it in some ways above King Lear, is the fact that it, there's stagecraft performed in the play itself. So Hamlet. These, these wandering actors come by and Hamlet gives them a story and makes them act it in front of Gertrude, in front of Claudius. To, and it's the, it's, the, it's the killing of the king and marrying of the queen by a brother. It's so obvious, right? And Claudius gets caught. Hamlet is there watching him. Um, so, it, and the, 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 Directions that Hamlet gives to the actors uh, present kind of philosophy of stagecraft, a philosophy of of drama, of and of represent, literary representation as a whole, which is self-reflective within the play, um, and a, a reflection on on what the play itself is doing as it's being acted. Uh, so that, that that level of reflection, both in Hamlet and the level of reflection on stagecraft uh, itself, and I'm putting on plays as an interesting one. That's part of the very uh, structure of the play itself.
Um, so the main conflict in the play, the main issue that everyone considers and tries to figure out is why does Hamlet hesitate to kill his uncle Claudius, who he knows has killed his father and married his mother? Why does he hold back? Um, that becomes an issue. And um, in, in Coleridge, we have a kind of reflection on it. I want to talk about the, the text that I gave you. I, I, I've, I've sent three PDFs. I've, I've attached them in the announcements. Um, and I just want to go over a couple of things in them as a kind of introduction. Coleridge is always uh, insightful. And I can't teach a course without using Coleridge somewhere. Um, so uh, his lectures on Shakespeare were widely were widely um, uh, viewed by London by, by the audiences in London. They were tremendous events. They would have been like it would have been like seeing Beethoven's Eighth Symphony put on or something like that for the first time. Um, you know, a, a, a new a new a, a new um, movie being premiered. Uh, he was that much of a literary a figure of, of literary criticism. Um, but there are literary critics before before Coleridge. Um, Samuel Johnson in the 18th century, Dryden in the late 18th century. Um, but I would say that shake that Coleridge's criticism, and we have a lot of the lecture notes. Uh, these are lecture notes. They're not. They're, they're records of the lecture. Um, begins a kind of modern criticism of Shakespeare. Uh, so what he says about Hamlet is interesting, and you should take a look at the PDF version that I've sent you on Canvas. Uh, but the first, the one marked lecture in one in parenthesis, uh, I'm going to begin there. Um, and um, one of the things that Coleridge does is defend what was formerly seen as indefensible in, in Hamlet. What has not, what's been neglected, Coleridge, this is one of Coleridge's great attributes of, of drawing out things that have been neglected or, or criticized and rejected and showing their greatness. So Hamlet is meant by Coleridge to portray some aspect of human nature. And this is on 386. He meant to portray a person whose view of the external world and all its incidents and objects were comparatively dim and of no interest in themselves, and which began to introduce interest only when they were reflected in the mirror of his mind. Hamlet beheld external objects in the same way as a man of vivid imagination who shuts his eyes, sees what has previously made an impression upon his organs of vision. So... Uh, it's an it's someone who whose whose outward vision is eclipsed by internal reflection. That produces a problem because Shakespeare, he says, places him in positions in which situations in which he has to act or he has to respond to these external things in 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 ways that are fast and quick. And, and, and require judgment. And Hamlet doesn't seem to have it because he's too inwardly directed. Shakespeare places him in the most stimulating circumstances that a human being can be placed in. So that, contra that conflict. He is the heir apparent of the throne. His father dies suspiciously. His mother includes the throne by marrying his uncle. This was not enough, but the ghost of the murdered father is introduced to assure the son that he was put to death by his own brother. What is the result? Endless reasoning and urging, perpetual solicitude of the mind to act, but his constant escape from action. So constantly deciding to act and, and then not acting. Um, ceaseless reproaches of himself for sloth, while the whole energy of his resolution passes away in those reproaches. This too not from cowardice, for he's made one of the bravest of his time, not from want of forethought or quickness of apprehension, 
for he sees through the very souls of all who surround him, but merely from that aversion to action, which prevails among such as have a world within themselves. Um, how admirable, and then Coleridge goes on, how admirable is the judging of the poet, Hamlet's own fancy has not conjured up the ghost of his father. That's the opening scene. It has been seen by others. He is by them prepared to witness its appearance, and when he does see it, he is not brought forward as having long brooded on the subject. So we, we have to take seriously the, the Hamlet's ghost, Hamlet's father's ghost appearing. It's not a figment of his imagination. It's not a projection. So Shakespeare doesn't allow that interpretation. Um, and we'll talk about that. So moral reflection occurs as the result of these tra the tranquil state of a mind that produces anxiety um, and all of the psychological debilities we see in him. Um, it's the most, Coleridge says, the most awful subject that can interest and being in this sentient world. And Hamlet, Hamlet's language is adapted to this high subject of revenge, murder within the family. Right? Notice that that's a big, big um, uh, um, issue in Beowulf, right? Uh, the, the murder of kin. So in some ways, I guess Beowulf does, is carried on in a, in a deeper way. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the play Hamlet. So there are connections to what we've read. Um, so he says, no character he has drawn could so properly express himself as in the language put into his mouth. So for Coleridge, the, the language Hamlet uses is perfectly suited to the character. And this makes Hamlet one of the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest of Shakespeare's plays. There was no indecision of Hamlet. He knew well what he ought to do, and over and over again he made up his mind to do it. But at the moment when he had to, he couldn't, because he kept thinking. With all this sense of duty, Coleridge says, this resolution of writing rising out of conviction, nothing is done. This admirable and consistent character, deeply acquainted with his own feelings, painting them with such wonderful power and accuracy. And just as strongly convinced of the fitness of execution, of executing the solemn charge committed to him, still yields to the same retiring from all reality, which is the result of having what we express by the terms a world within himself. So what's interesting about this is that there's a representation of a whole world inside of Hamlet, which seems to be at odds with the whole world that's represented outside. And again, this finds another representation play representing a play within a play. So this double level of reflection in Hamlet in various different ways produces this remarkable, this remarkable drama, psychic drama. Um, he says Hamlet possesses greatness of genius, which led Hamlet to perfect knowledge of his own character, which with all strength and motive was so weak as to be unable to carry into effect his most obvious duty. And we should take this as a duty. He's required of to, to, uh, uh, the ghost to do, to Hamlet's ghost to do this. We'll talk about that. L lastly, on pl page 390, Shakespeare wished to impress upon us the truth that action is the great end of existence, that no faculties of intellect, however brilliant, can be considered valuable or otherwise than as misfortunes, if they withdraw us from or render us repugnant to action and lead us to think and think of doing until time has escaped when we ought to have acted. Fascinating. Right? That this is the great object of, of representation. It, so it's shown in a character who thinks too much and can't act. It's better seen that way, and it's negative than it's positive. In, in, in enforcing this truth, Shakespeare has shown the fullness and force of his powers. All that is amiable and excellent in nature is combined in Hamlet, with the exception of one, this one quality. He is a man living in meditation, called upon to act by every human motive and divine, 
but the great purpose of his life defeated by continually resolving to do so, yet doing nothing but resolve. Uh, a brilliant account of, ha of Hamlet. If you look on page 391 of that first PDF, there's a letter from Henry Crabb Robinson to Mrs. Clarkson, both of whom would have known Coleridge well. And uh, in the middle of it, it says, somebody said to me, this is a satire on himself. So somebody in the audience says, Coleridge's Hamlet, Coleridge's Hamlet is actually Coleridge. And um, Henry Crabb Robinson's response was, no, it is an elegy. So the lecture itself is, a, is an elegy to Coleridge's own Hamlet-like qualities. Um, imagine being there at this lecture, knowing Coleridge and realizing he's interpreting Hamlet through his own, through his own experience. To think, to think that Coleridge thought about this about himself, that action was the great thing and, and that he never performed it. Coleridge's life is one of tremendous regret. Um, he seems to have lived his life in poetry and in writing and in drama rather than in life. Uh, and he led a very sad, uh, unhappy life. Um, his writings are, great, are truly great because of that in some ways. Again, I, as I've said, Coleridge is my, my most important influence. Um, I, I find him, uh, his, his, his poetry, his writings, his philosophy, his theology, his criticism of literature, to be of the highest order and the most useful for thinking about um, my own academic life. Um, so a great figure here. Um, so um, this, the, uh, the, the second PDF, um, you can open up and just take a look at some. There are basically comments on major lines and scenes. There are comments on Ophelia's, on Hamlet's, dreadful treatment of Ophelia. There are comments uh, on, on Claudius. There are comments on Gertrude, whether Gertrude knew, in fact, did know that, um, that her husband was killed, poisoned by his brother. Um, there are conjectures on that. There are conjectures on, on Hamlet's inaction. Um, and so you can take a look at that. Um, there are other... Um, um, play, there are other there are comments about other, other aspects of this. One of the things also that Coleridge talks about in this, uh, and this is another great mark of literature, one of the things he said about great literature is that every part comes to contribute to the whole. There's nothing missing, and there's nothing super added that would be digression. Nothing extra. And Hamlet exists as one of these perfect, and, and that's quite a thing for as great to, to, to do something as great and the breadth to have a to have a, a narrative in which all the parts fit so perfectly, and there's nothing missing and nothing nothing extra. Um, that's quite a claim. Um, so just a couple of more things to look out for, and I'm going to stop th this introductory lecture, and we'll start the next lecture with Hamlet. Uh, there are many meanings of the word nature in this play, and you should attend to them all. Um, nature as human nature, nature as in the nature of, of societal relations, nature as in just the natural world, the vegetable and animal world of which human beings play a part in, one's own nature, Hamlet's nature as a personality. Um, so all of these, all of these meanings of nature occur. This happens in many, many of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, the word nature is equivocal in other words. And so you should be on the lookout for what the meanings are when they're used. Um, there, there are, there are, um, a number of dichotomies that Shakespeare dramatizes. One of them is the draw is the 
the disparity between seeming and appearance on the one side and reality on the other. This plays into the possibility of falsehood and truth. Do these have a spiritual um, What is that spiritual reality for Shakespeare? Um, can we glimpse it? That's a question that can be raised. Um, clearly, the issue of virtue and vice, of motives, comes into play as it as it tackles the question of appearance and reality and falsehood and truth. Within that, we have the idea of the play and reality. And we can get a sense of what Shakespeare thought a play was like in relation to reality if Hamlet is the spokesperson for that. I think he is. Um, so the problem of representation itself depends upon the disjunction between appearance and reality. So the play can be seen as a kind of exploration of that whole question. How do we represent things to ourselves? And, and can we ever get to reality? Well, we have to get through them to representation since they could be false and wrong and appearance and rather than reality. We have to deal with, with, the, with truth through the lens of representation. We can't get around that question. So Hamlet dramatizes that basic human problem of how do we come to know what's true if all we have is our own representations of it, our own experience of it, which is limited, prone to mistakes, um, easily, uh, easily undermined by, own, by our own foibles and failures and psychic debilities. Um, so um, so that's, that becomes represented in the play itself. Okay, uh, so that's a good introduction to Hamlet. Um, the next lecture will start with the play itself.